Hello and a warm welcome to all our listeners and viewers tuning into What's Stewing. I'm Abid Hussain, founder CEO of Creators2, your host for this journey into the heart of content. Uh, we have an exceptional episode for you today. We are joined by the team behind Goggle.my, the amazing Uma and Bahir, the trailblazers in the realm of movie, television and pop culture criticism. They are the ones who delve deep into the intricacies of our favorite shows and films, offering us those hard-hitting analysis and thought-provoking commentaries that we can't get enough of. From debating the feasibility of the Mighty Ducks, the infamous play in real life, to discussing the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow, Dogler Admire has become the go-to community for those who love to peel back the layers of pop culture. Their unique blend of humor, insight and comprehensive coverage has turned them into the beloved hub of, for fans and critics alike. So without further ado, welcome Uma and Bahir. Thank, Thank you. you. And today we are excited to explore the world of pop culture through their eyes and get a sneak peek behind their creative process. Maybe even settle a few pop culture debates along the way. So let's dive right in and we warmly welcome the team and uh, it's fantastic to have you on the show today. Great to be here, man. Thanks very Thank much. You. Yeah. So the first question, sure. and uh, can you share with us the story behind Goggler.my? What inspired you to create this one-stop shop for movie, television and pop culture criticism? Hmm. I think you should start this one. Okay. Because, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, We've both been doing this in some form for a while. I used to write a lot of film reviews. I used to do it on radio. Bahe was on the other side. He was in production. So he used to make movies, indie films. Uh, but we've always had a passion for film, television, pop culture. I think the idea of Goggler came about because we found that we were going to a lot of foreign sources for the kind of reading and opinion that we enjoyed. And we found there was a Malaysian voice that was lacking because we still think, I don't know if this is quite arrogant for us to say, but as Malaysians, not just us, but all Malaysians, I think we have a much more rounded perspective. Like Americans and the people in the West are only exposed to one specific kind of content most of the time. Yep. But we grew up here watching American movies, British movies, Tamil movies, Hindi movies, Chinese movies. We watched everything growing up. It was always on TV, right? And so when we approach a piece of content, I think our base knowledge is a lot wider. And even if you speak to the everyday person about their perspective on a film, they're already coming at it, having 20 years of Bollywood and Jackie Chan movies and all of this stuff. So it's a completely different approach to critique and conversation, all of that. And so we thought, actually, there might be something unique here, not just for Malaysia, but for the, the world, right, globally. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, I mean, everything we do here is not isolated anymore. We're on the internet, we're on Instagram, we're on the web. It's global. And that was kind of like our driving factor to setting this up. And then the other thing was, there's a lot of the stuff, there's a lot of stuff on the internet out there. Yeah. But they cater to younger audiences. Because what you see on TikTok and stuff, always caters for that 18 to 25 audience. And, you know, we're both 40s, and we were thinking, who's catering for the group that grew up? Like, sure, when you're young, you're scrolling through and you're enjoying that stuff, but then you reach a point, you have a family, you have kids, you want something more substantial, and no one is talking to you. And so we kind of wanted to set up Goggler as that space for all of the people who kind of grow up and then want to still do conversations about film, TV, and pop culture. That was the idea behind it. Oh, lovely. lovely. Yeah. And what do you believe sets Goggler uh, apart from other movie and TV criticism platforms? And how do you maintain your unique voice in the crowded space of, uh, of pop culture commentary? I think, I think it's a lot of what Uma said earlier. We have a different perspective. We have, you know, we, our... our our perspective of a Jackie Chan film isn't Rush Hour. It's the 20 he made before that. You know, it's that we come to it from a point of there's so much history. And I think we as reviewers, as commentators, we take all of that into account. You know, um, 
we have different experiences. Uma comes from it. Uma comes to it from a very academic point of view. I come from it. I come to review from a very emotional point of view. Um, so there's a there's that different yeah different perspective. But we also look at reaching the people, the people that Uma was talking about. Right? We're not academic. We're not taking a. We're not reviewing a film from an academic standpoint. We're reviewing it from a man on the street kind yeah. of point of view. And also adding that layer of pop, right? I mean, so even if we bring a kind of critique, academic critique to a film, the whole idea is to make it accessible so everyone can appreciate it. I think there is a basic level of cinematic understanding already yeah. because we're exposed to yeah. so much. Uh, so even if you're not consciously aware. When you watch a TikTok video, even mm. you kind of know why they cut it in a certain way and why they edit it. You may not know the technical reasons behind it, but yeah. you know what they're trying to do to you, right? And how they're trying to manipulate you emotionally. So that so we we're coming at it to an audience in 2023 who already have a basic understanding of cinematic language, and so we always want to kind of push them. Like push the audience a little bit, right? Yeah. The movie is not just something you switch off your brain, you watch, and then you go home. It actually affects your life in some way, and we want to tell people why that is. Yeah. And also, you make it more easy for people to to understand. Hopefully. <laughs> and also, I mean, I've been following you guys, and, and and I'm a big fan of your work, and and uh, I understand what you're trying to say that that uh, you're not giving that whole uh, big uh, you know, film school jargon behind yeah, it. Yeah. 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 You are you're you're trying to make the common man understand that okay, this was yeah. done because of this, and this that's yeah. why how it affected the story. Yeah. How it uh, how it went yeah. the direction it was supposed to go in. Also, like. For us, we we resisted the uh, the 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 requests from both audiences and from even like studios and distributors to do the like thumbs up, thumbs down. We we didn't want to do it for so long because we felt like a movie isn't that. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's a good movie. It doesn't describe a film. You need analysis. You yes. need why did that guy do that thing and why is it bad? Why did that character do that thing, and it was good. Why did the writer do that, which shocked and surprised us? I think that's just—I wouldn't say just as important. In fact, I say it's more important than just four out of five stars. Yeah, it took us, it took us a long time to agree to do numbered ratings on the site, and even then, even now, we spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of time justifying that mm. number because I'm like, that's important. Yeah, it's not enough to just say something is eight out of ten or six out of ten. You got to justify the number, otherwise it's just meaningless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we even then we sort of go back and forth, like, oh, you gave this an eight. We both loved it, but did we? But you gave that other thing an eight, and then it's like, oh, but it's not a comparison. They're a it's scale not the on its same own. Thing, you know? right? So that it's like, that conversation that we have within ourselves and with each other, and justifying that to the guy on Instagram who says, oh. The goggles guy said, "This is eight out of ten." So that uh, that means it carries value because you're bringing analysis along with it. It's just not that you, yeah. uh, one fine yeah. day you're sitting and watching that. Oh, let's give him an eight. Yeah, oh. yeah. And yeah, you have yeah. to, right? I mean, like, I, and I think, and, and you know this a bit. I mean, like, you've met many professional critics throughout your career. I don't think there's a single critic in the world who loves those number ratings or those star ratings. <laughs> everyone hates it. Yeah. But every newspaper, every studio, everyone's like, "Quickly, la, just give us something over ten. Yeah. What do you think over five? Yeah. And I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we should like. I think just for kicks, we should change our rating from. We we'll do it ten now, right? With ten, yeah. You know what we should do? We should just do over eight. Yeah, I over know. 16. I love it. You know what I love? Like, you know what I love? And I'm sure uh, viewers of this will notice this as well. When people go, I'm giving that a six point seven. Where does the point seven come from? <laughs> What does that even it's, mean? It's because that previous film I gave a six point five, and this is marginally like better than six point seven. It just yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> and they do it not just for film, right? It's like ah, oh, this pizza is a five point two. What does that mean? Uh. <laughs> so that makes us go to the next question. That uh, could you walk us through your process of creating? I means this whole uh, content first of all, how you make your content, and what goes behind it, and also. Uh, how do you decide on 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 these ratings and your analysis? What what is your thought process behind that? So, I mean, there is the only thing that we know that we are somewhat good at <laughs> is 
our ability to kind of watch movies and provide some analysis. Everything else we are still learning in the sense that the world is changing every day, right? Yep. Half the time we're still trying to figure out social media and what works on the web and what works on Instagram and like, we tried TikTok for a while and then we were like, I think we're too old for TikTok, man. None of this makes sense yeah, to us. Yeah. But so we're still learning about the kind of avenues in which the content comes out in. However, the one thing that we know for sure and that we're certain about is what kind of content we want to put out. And I think for us, the most important thing is putting out content that will make people think, that will make people want to talk and engage and actually have a discussion I think that for us is the most important thing. Yeah, because for us, like my fondest memories of watching a film is the two hour mama session afterwards. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, that's the best part, right? Like, yeah. And from the time we were kids, right? From when, the time we were if kids, you go, right? If your, yeah. your mom drives you with your group of friends to the cinema, drops you off, picks you up, the conversation in the car afterwards yes. is yeah. everyone yeah. is like, yeah. 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 And I think that's, that's what we want to bring to the table, right? We want to remind people the conversation is good. It's not just, hey, this movie is terrible. You shouldn't go watch it. You know, that's not the point. The point is, why was it bad? Why was it good? And that's what we love to do. Also, I think, you know, a point to make, the, the one thing we rarely ever do on the site is we rarely tell people, do not go and watch a movie. Yeah. Even if a movie is terrible, we will tell people, go and watch it, make up your own mind, and then fight us, right? Yeah. <laughs> we just like argue with us yeah. if you like it. Yeah. And, but because we want people to experience the bad stuff to know what the bad stuff is and the good stuff to know what the good stuff is. I mean, you can't know the good stuff until you've seen the bad, right? Yes. Because you don't, you don't have a scale. Yeah. You need to keep I mean, dropping the, the, the floor so that you can see how high we can go. I mean, yeah. there are rare occasions like when a movie is there so bad. We have, we're yeah. like, do not encourage this person to make more movies. Don't go yeah. for that movie. We've like, done that too. <laughs> and, and, and you know what it is? And it's not a technical thing. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I think as critics as well, we believe our responsibility is twofold, right? We think on the one hand, it is to support the art. Yeah. Because I think criticism is incredibly important, supporting Def the art, and it's just, it doesn't exist in Malaysia, and it needs to. Like, real criticism needs to, and then I think that makes the art better. And even if you look at Hollywood, even if you take a present-day example from just three weeks ago, what happened with the MCU, the Variety article, all of that criticism has forced Disney to rejig what they're doing. It's not just box office numbers, because mm. God knows DC kept doing it for years. <laughs> so I don't think it's just the box office numbers. I think it's people sitting in a room going, why have people stopped loving us? Yeah. What do we need to do? So I think the cri criticism is very important. You have to support the art. We completely support the artist's right to fail. We like people when they make huge moonshots, ambitious I mean, shots. How's a Gucci? <laughs> yeah. House so of Gucci is a great example of a moonshot that missed. But it was a fun watch. Yeah. Right. right. Then our second responsibility is towards the audience in that Malaysians only have a limited amount of money in their wallets. And I think they look to recommendations to decide how to spend that money. They've had a long, long, painful week at work, sometimes going to the movies with their family is the only escape they have. And I think if you're not an honest critic, that reflects badly. Like this person, you've just made this person spend like 200 bucks buying tickets for his whole family, popcorn, drinks. They will hate you for the They will hate the you. La. They'll be like, what is this? I've wasted yeah. my like actual money. <laughs> and you, so, you lose your street cred. Right? And yeah. so I think that responsibility is twofold. No, I, I come, but have you seen, I mean, taking, uh, you know, uh, from, from where, where, what you said that, have you seen somebody getting criticized for their work has really improved in their, in their next offering? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, what, locally? Uh? Locally, I'm oh. talking about that. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. Prop, mm. I mean, to be fair, I think we are only just getting to that point where directors, and people behind the screens are taking our criticism seriously. Yes. You know, prior no, to No, but this, I'm trying to think before. I'm trying to think of the critics in the past. So I'm just trying to think in like Malaysia. In general? Oh, no. In general, yeah. if anyone has made a movie, not reacted badly to the criticism, and then gone, let me do it differently sometimes. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think that also comes to the wider problem of the Malaysian film industry, in that it can be, other than a handful, it can be difficult to set up your next picture. Yes. So a bad review may 
no, I would, I would, a bad review, I think, is one thing. But I think a bad box office returns will can mean that your next picture happens a lot further away. Yeah. And I think that's why we're struggling thinking about a, a director who's followed up a bad movie with a good one. Yeah, yeah. I think so. That's it, Amit. We are under no illusions, sir. No one really gives a shit what critics say. <laughs> I to mean, be fair, honestly, to be yeah. fair, yeah. Come on. I don't think critics make or break a movie. No, they don't, but at least they 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 have a voice. They can tell you from from a space of you know yes. trying to uplift the the quality of, mm. of of content. I don't. But the problem is here. I don't think filmmakers. I don't think Malaysian filmmakers see criticism as us trying to uplift the industry. They see it as why are you tearing me down? Why are you trying to steal rice from my rice bowl? Which I feel is the wrong yeah. is the wrong reaction to it. Right? We're not also because also because. More often than not, critics are not coming from a place of malice. At least no mm. one I know yeah. uh, in the industry as well. I don't think... The, it's, it's, not, it's not personal. Yeah. I, mean, um, I think the personal factor happens with the audience. Mm. Because the audience is like, this is my hard-earned money. You've made me pay for this and you give me that. Yeah. And I think that's more personal than what the critic is doing, right? Yeah. Um, so, no, I can't think of a concrete example to your question. I don't know. But I do know... When it comes to things like theatre and stuff in Malaysia, yeah. I do know there are some practitioners who read the work and actually who read the criticism and actually consider what was said about it. Mm. I've seen that happen. Mm. With film, I don't know. So moving on to the, the, the highlight of Goggler was hard-hitting analysis on, on any art product is fascinating. But what inspired this whole particular Mighty Doug's uh, Mighty Ducks uh, piece and uh, what was the most surprising finding from this uh, analysis? No, no, I mean, you know, when you talk about the pop culture stuff, right, I think we like doing things like that because I think that's the kind of stuff we like reading about. Mm. Yeah. Reviews are reviews and I think they provide the public with an overview and maybe a recommendation of something to watch or maybe something not to watch. But actually the most fun stuff is when you deep dive into a film. Yeah. And even when we were growing up, there was no internet, right? So it was only much later when we encountered these articles of someone going, oh, well, you know, I spoke to professional hockey players and, you know, that flying V thing. And, you know, they like, go into a deep dive. And I think it, not just with the Mighty Ducks, but it applies to a whole bunch of yeah. other movies. The feasibility of action sequences, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson does it all the time, every time he sees a science fiction yeah. movie. That's the kind of stuff that we like reading and that we like getting into. Uh, and it's not just the scientific analysis, but also the Easter eggs, the movie connections. You know, when you watch a, yeah, when you watch a Scorsese movie, it's like, you know, he's one of the greatest, but who inspires him? And where has he picked up cues from? And what does that scene homage? We are geeks for all kinds yeah. of stuff. Like I think, that I think that's, that's the important bit. I think yes. that's the important word. We're geeks and nerds about it, right? So we're not, we're not just film critics. We love reading about the business of Hollywood. We have read multiple books on just the business of Hollywood. Still don't understand with how they get away with some of the stuff Holly we do, but you We know. still don't understand Hollywood accounting, but we've read multiple books on it. Yeah, know? But it's is that, crazy. Is that, that's what we want. That's what we do. We, we feel like that serves everything and that goes with the 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 the, the stupid uh, the stupid sort of like deep dive into did that shoe that he was wearing mean anything you know it's yeah you know we get excited when 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 nike released the nike air mags from back to the future but then we then went as far as like oh how far how real is the tech and all that, that, that. so we go too far almost always and then pair it back for social media. Yeah. But it's because we like that. That's what we like. That's what we do with each other. And we feel like sometimes, ah, oh, maybe there's seven people on our Instagram page who might want who to might know like about it. This. Who yeah. might be interested in something like that? Yeah. I might I be mean, the one. Yeah. I might be the I mean, one. Okay. Yeah, just <laughs> send it to you from now on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But th that makes really compelling content. Come no, to no, think of it. Not only that, but also. We're thinking about it, but that means someone on the production thought about it. Yes. Well. The director thought about it. The writers thought about the it. The production I, designer, the yeah, wardrobe designer. And I think, not like now we have the ability to get that information to people quicker. 
Yeah. In the past, you'd have to wait 10 years for someone to write a book about Back yeah. to the Future. Yeah. 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 And then you get all the interesting information yeah. about it, right? And I think part of that is part of the reason for our sort of, well, not reason, but the what has come from us being geeks and nerds about these things is that studios are offering us production designers. Studios are offering us, uh, for interviews rather, you know, offering us the composers, which are people like no nobody else, else in Malaysia cares. You know, but we care because that scene in Loki wouldn't have worked without that piece of music. Yes. You know, there's a reason for that, right? Yeah. And I think that kind of stuff we love. When I went to the... When I went to the Academy Museum in Los Angeles, they had the mandolin that the Godfather theme song was written on. Wow. But that mandolin was also on Dean Martin's That's Amore. So it's that, it's that stupid nerd thing that we do that we love. Nobody else probably cares, but we do, right? <laughs> well, no, no, that's what geeks are all about. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but also it's the subconscious triggers, right? When you're just going back to the episode of Loki, for example, even a slight shift in the intro music mm. signifies the, how the tone of the entire episode is going to change. Yeah. Now, you may not notice it or what it's doing, but it's doing it to you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, that's the great stuff, lah. Mm. No, that, that's, uh, and those are small, small things which make a great content piece. Yeah. And yeah. As, as viewers, as critics, as, you know, uh, as followers of great content, you can pick it out. Mm. Yeah. You can still, yeah. and there's something, something and is missing out there or something yeah. different think, will happen. And I think that this falls into our education mindset, right? We want to get other people to notice the music. We want to get other people to notice that, oh, there's a shift in color there. Yeah. Yeah. That means he's angry. That means he's happy. We want to get into explaining to kids, to, to, to film goers, what a Dutch angle means. Yeah. It's not just a skew. There's a directorial decision. There's a storytelling decision that was made to give that Dutch angle reason. But also, it's so important now, just going back to what we were saying earlier about people watching videos all the time, right? Like, never in history has there been this much video content out in the world on a daily basis. Our kids are being exposed to it. Grown-ups are being exposed to it. And for me, suddenly, this work becomes very important. Yeah. Because how do you interpret and understand what is being pushed to you? It affects your day-to-day -day life. It affects your politics. You need to understand when a politician makes a video as well and it's cut and edited in a certain way, they're doing something to you. They're manipulating your opinion in some way. And unless you understand the language of cinema, you got, you're going to get manipulated. Yeah, you're yeah, going to get yeah. fooled. Right? So this is happening all around the world. At this yeah, exactly. Time. Like, we think the best season of TV is when the American elections come around. Because the kind of videos you see online, right? The, the, the political videos and all that. Oh, we yeah. go back and forth. We're like, oh, the Lincoln Project did this. I'm feeling like this. And then, oh, but then the Republican Party does this. The Democratic Party does this. Because to us, it's content. Yeah. 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 I mean, like in that sense, Malaysia is still a bit behind. La. Like our, our politics is still maybe about five years in the past. I, I, the, I say further back. Further back. I with regards to the back. level of smartness and manipulation mm. when it comes to like online videos and yeah. stuff like that but we're getting there like we saw even in the most recent election it was happening on TikTok and all of that stuff and so those conversations are very important because there were teenagers who were watching it yeah. so like I keep telling Bahe all the time I'm like I'm sorry it is as important for you to know who directed Goodfellas or Schindler's List as it is for you to know who wrote Pride and Prejudice yeah. mm. or Romeo and Juliet yeah. like you're considered an idiot if you cannot answer a question, right? Oh, you don't know William Shakespeare? But why do you not know Steven Spielberg? It is mm. as important yeah. right now. Yeah. But yeah, yet story... we put literature on a pedestal. Yeah, mm. and, and those are also not... yeah, storytellers, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but also, it's more important. Like, I mean, I love my reading and I have a lot of books, but normally all these young kids aren't reading these days, but they're watching film. And I'm like, we should, we should actually start focusing on what they're watching and what yeah, they're yeah, learning yeah, from yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's also this thing of like, Yes, William Shakespeare is a great writer, but in his time, there were people who were bad writers and they've been forgotten, right? So, yes. so in film, we will forever remember, Scorsese will remember Spielberg. There will be some dummy filmmaker that we will never think about anymore. And that's the same conversation. It's this conversation that, oh, you don't know who William Shakespeare is? Yeah, but you also don't know who William Shakespeare's counterparts were at the yeah. time. So you only remember him because he's good. Uh, we need to do the same with cinema. Yeah. 
No, that's a very, very good point. And I think that's very relevant in, in today's... Uh, like, know, I, I honestly think it should be taught in schools. Exactly. And, and I think these, these films, these TV shows are, are, are part of education for the kids nowadays. Because it's being ignored by yeah. teachers and parents. But actually, the kids are learning all of this stuff. Yeah. Completely well, out of the purview of government, mm -hmm. teachers, and parents, right? Well, I, I, I would say the, the government thing, I think we have to hold back. I think they are, I'm okay with them. With them being, not knowing like not yeah, knowing, yeah, I think that I'm okay with that. I, I like my government less in my entertainment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we talk a lot about how, how, how audiences are, are, you know, reacting to things what they watch. So in that, how do you foster community engagement and, and encourage discussions? Among your, you know, readers and and, and followers on, on social. We, uh, when when we find out, we'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, we don't know, man. To be fair, we don't really know. I but, mean, you're at the mercy of the algorithm. Yeah, that's one thing. Honestly speaking, we're not the kind of people. Like, maybe it's a function of age, lah. Mm. But we're not the kind of people who sit around going, "What can we make that will go viral, lah?" Yeah. Like that's not our purpose. But, I think we kind of sit around thinking about what cool stuff we can make, mm. and hopefully, people will appreciate it. But even that cool stuff comes from a thing, right? It's a, oh, Knives Out has got a second movie coming out. What can we do to get people talking about Knives Out? Oh, um, what was the one we did? You cooked something once. The oh. Parasite. Parasite did yeah. that thing about the... Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, ramen. 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 ramen with the ramen. high-end Wagyu, Korean yeah. Wagyu. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so we did that as a video. But, I, but we also released an article talking about what that meant as a social class breakdown thing. If there's a reason for it, we'll convert it to video or convert it to content and then take that further. But we don't sit around going, we need a new social media post. I think, I think, we'd, be a lot, I think we'd be a lot richer if we did that. But the problem yeah. is, but we're not that <laughs> smart. Oh no. Uh, yeah, smart. I think we're not that no, smart. No. Yes, but also we don't care. Yes, yes, that's I think true. The big one I think for us, care. right, the idea is to create that engagement. We, yeah. want, we want the people who engage with our content to generally want to talk to us about it. I think, yeah, it's because we don't want to engage based on the algorithm's terms. Yes. Okay. So we, when we do a video with an interview with an actor, we don't do the, hey, say a Malay word. It's funny, you know, because we don't want that audience. We don't want the yeah. people who like that kind of stuff. We want to, We want the audience. Much to our detriment. But, much to our detriment. <laughs> much to our detriment. But we but, want to talk to the. To, yeah, we like, want the audience to be the ones who want to see a ten minute, a twenty minute conversation with Steven Soderbergh, yeah. which we did. You know. But for me, the reason is that you are speaking to some of the most accomplished people in the world. Exactly. There are maybe like when you speak to Soderbergh or you speak to a director of a Marvel movie, it's a 300 million. There are maybe, what, 20 people in the world mm. who would be handed the reins to a 300 million. Yeah. I can't even imagine what that money is, right? Exactly. And why would you do that? You want to tap into their brain. Yeah. You want to learn something, yeah. right? And so I think that's our driving philosophy yes. over everything. And it's because it's rooted in our own curiosity, in yeah. the sense that every time we do an interview, the questions we ask is because we genuinely want to know. Mm. No, but that's that's the beauty of Goggler. Then, and from from a fan perspective, I means that's the kind of questions which you ask, the kind of content you guys are making. I means I'm a film buff, and I understand from where you guys are coming in, and and, I, and you guys are asking the right questions They're, without making them feel dumb. Then right. Why are you asking these kind of questions? Yeah, same, right. Yeah. yeah. Means they have a set of questions. I means I'm not talking about it with people who who have no clue about who Soderbergh is and who yeah. Scorsese is. But when they go into and they get the opportunity to go and have an, a conversation with these guys, you need to ask the right yeah, questions. Yeah, correct. Yeah. You just can't go dumb down and, you know, so what do you think about this? And what yeah, do you no, think about Have you that? tried durians yet? Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, no. It's because, and I think it goes back to the idea that as much as it may have bring us success, that's not the audience we want. We want the audience that wants to know what the conversation is. Why did Jonathan Majors make that decision when he did that scene? Because that's important. That's important to you as an audience, uh, to you as a consumer of that content, but also it's important. It could even be go so far as to it being important to that young actor. But also it changes the way you watch a movie mm. because I genuinely had my mind changed after I've spoken to a director in the sense that, or if I've listened to an interview with a director, sometimes I come up from a movie and I think, eh, it was all right. 
I'm just having a lukewarm reaction, right? But then when I listen to the interviews and I see where they're coming from, and then I re-watch the movie, it completely changes my viewing of the film. And I think that's, that's the thing, right? It is very rare that there are maybe few occasions when a movie or a TV show is objectively good or bad. Most of the time, it's on this spectrum. Because hmm. you watch a movie, you bring your own baggage with it, you would love it, and I may hate it, right? Um, I think The Marvels is a very good example of that. We absolutely love The Marvels. There are a lot of people who didn't like it. But we sat down in the cinema, and for us, it was fun and bright and entertaining, and it reminded us of the kind of movies we enjoyed watching as a kid. Oh. And so it brought us back to our childhood, and we were like, yeah, this is great, this is fun, yeah. right? Yeah. And, but that's because of our own baggage, of our own experiences and all of that stuff. Mm. Um, Elemental is a very good example. Pixar's Elemental, I swear to God, if you go and listen to an interview with the director, if you didn't like the movie, it'll completely shift your perspective. Mm. I left Elemental the first time going, yeah, that was an okay movie. I didn't hate it. After listening to the director, I was like in tears the second time I watched the movie. Because suddenly, like, there's all this, like, director talking about his family of immigrants and all of this stuff and the stuff he kind of put into it. And I'm just like, whoa. And it changes. So we don't believe that movies exist in isolation. Lah. So it is everything that you bring into it. Also, it is changes over time. Yes. We've gone back and oh. watched a movie from two years ago, three years ago. Maybe I was too harsh on it. Yeah. Or maybe I was too, I was too caught up in the excitement. You can, we, we as critics have to accept that that changes as well. Th that is the, like, that happens so much. Yeah. This weekend, this weekend just gone, I sat down and I rewatched The Phantom, the Billy Zane <laughs> Phantom, because it just popped up on one of my streaming feeds and I watched it, okay? That movie got panned. Yeah. And I was watching it and I'm just like, I can't remember why I hated this. Mm. Sure, it's not great. But it's an hour and 40 minutes of fun. Yeah. Like nobody is taking that seriously. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I've got two great examples. Uh, Sylvester Stallone's Oscar. Yep. From 1994, 93. It was hated when it came out. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see it in the cinema. I, I stumbled across it many, many years later. And every time I've seen it, I've loved it. It's the story about this mob boss whose daughter is trying to get married and there's all this confusion around the characters. It's just a fun movie. It's not groundbreaking. It's not going to be remembered 40 years, 50 years down. But it's fun. And I think movies can just be fun. Yeah. 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 Sometimes we forget that. And Sometimes that's, we forget uh, that. People forget that it's for entertainment. Exactly. But entertainment first. Yes. If there's a message behind it, great. If there's a moral behind it, if there's history behind it, awesome. Fantastic, right? Killers of the Flower Moon. There's a, we found it Completely entertaining, entertaining, not in a happy, happy way, but <laughs> it's not a happy movie. It's not a happy movie, but we enjoyed our time in the cinema. And again, enjoy it's the wrong word. But there's then also history behind it. You yeah. go back and you read, right? It's this reminding audiences that you can go back and wiki a thing. You should go back and wiki a thing. Find out about the story behind this story that Scorsese is trying to tell. Yeah. It's not just three and a half hours and you leave and It's not a monolith, right? It's, it's not like it's not just, because, yeah, you're right. just yeah. because he made this three and a half hour movie, three and a half hour thing. It is. It isn't the be all and end all. It isn't yeah. the end of the story. Yeah. And, and it, it also starts a lot many conversations. Yes. And it's, it should. I think people don't do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. Because that, that's what filmmakers want. They want to start the conversation. Before that movie came out, nobody knew what was happening exactly. in that yeah. in yeah. Omaha. You may have known if you studied a certain amount of social studies in America, but I'm may pretty know. sure what maybe 0.001% of Malaysians knew about it. I like would, the, I would the handful say a lot who bought less. the book yeah. probably know it, right? Yeah. But in Malaysia, it was a truly educational experience. Like I left it going, Oof. and yeah. I think I think people should leave that cinema realizing it's an ex educational experience. It can't. It's not preachy, it's not lectury, and that's the point of entertainment. It shouldn't be those things, but it should also introduce you to new ideas. Exactly. But introduce you to new concepts. That's what distinguishes a good movie from a bad movie as well, right? Because mm. there are bad movies that are very educational, but they're terribly made. It, and so yeah. the entertainment value is completely sucked out of it. Yeah. Meanwhile, Scorsese being Scorsese or Spielberg being Spielberg, there is this fantastic balance between mm. knowing how to entertain an audience but still get your message across. Yeah, yeah. So good. And even, even go so far as something like Gareth Edwards' Godzilla film. Right? Yeah. It, it's okay. Maybe there's no there's no 
a, 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 a study on Godzilla, the character and all that stuff. But the world that it was first written in is important. The Toho Godzilla films yes. was written why? That's important. It is in response to the American atomic bombs. Correct. And you know what's interesting? When you read the book, so the, the, the Godzilla and Godzilla Unleashed or Godzilla Returns uh, is the two novellas which mm. the movies were based on, right? On the first page of the book, the writer says, um, Godzilla is a made-up fictional creature. However, the atomic bombs that created him are very much a reality. Mm. And there's this short paragraph where he describes the metaphor to you. And so you know exactly where he's coming from because it was such a Japanese preoccupation. Yeah. And for him, it's like, I am part of a group of people who are actively against atomic mm. kabooms, right? Mm. And I think that's important. The metaphor is described. And so therefore, every Godzilla spin-off movie, whatever, always seems to go back to that route. It should Which I think is important. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about from from a Malaysian content creation, from, from film, from television? Do you think the directors are putting that much of thought process in, in creating a, a story or writing a script which uh, is, you know, created in such a way that it's thought prov provoking or, you know, it will be part of, you know, history or people when they come out of the theater, they will have a serious discussion? The short answer is no. No. I, I, you I don't believe that. I don't. I don't believe that's. I, yeah. I've, we've seen it. We try to see almost every single local movie that comes out every year, and we've grown up watching a whole bunch of movies. And for me, you don't need a critic to tell you that. Mm. For me, you, you have the audience, and their reaction as well. Why is it that in 2023, if you go out on the street right now and you ask people to recommend a Malaysian movie to you, they will almost always go back to P. Ramli. And he stopped making movies decades ago. He died decades ago. Like, why do we always go back to that? Mm. One, it's because it's the only unifying piece of pop culture that we all have. Malays, Chinese, Indians, whoever. Like, P. Ramli and Lat are probably the two pieces of pop culture that we all get around. Otherwise, we're just looking at our own stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Chinese stuff, Indian stuff, English stuff, whatever. But I think it's a factor of how the industry works, right? Everyone is just scrambling to make stuff. I think there are a handful of directors who do exactly what you're saying, but they don't get funding as often as they should. I, I, you're, you're right, but I would even, have, with my experience, I would go so far as to say it's an industry problem. I've pitched shows for RTM and RTM doesn't care what the show is. They want to know that it fits a particular time slot. Who are your actors? Um, this is the budget you're going to get. So you're playing with that. The story is almost secondary. In fact, the, the uh, secondary is not, the story is not even important. What's important? Oh, it's in my Islamic time slot. It's got, must have these characters and these actors because they are famous now. So we bring them in. Uh, it's a 30 minute episode. So this is the budget you get. It's math. It's not even creative. The lines that are being said, it's almost irrelevant from character to character. <laughs> And I think that's the problem. You come to it with, I've seen the RTM cheat sheets. Uh, they're not short, not cheat sheets, but the <laughs> proposal sheets. I've seen them. I've had to write to them. You know, I've had, I've, I've got folders at home of just like, I've got 12 ideas, which can, which idea will fit which RTM proposal. And then you submit and then you don't get it because my company or the company I was submitting under is not friends with the programmer. So it's not even creatively driven. Yeah. So it's irrelevant. The so story just, 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 just story is unimportant, yeah. right? Which famous actor are you going to get? Oh, him cannot. The studio is angry with him. Oh, that guy cannot because he did a show for other channel. Yeah. That guy cannot. He's got too small a following on social media. Too small a following. And this is not uniquely a Malaysian problem, right? I know. Uh, even when you see the Hollywood Reporter roundtables yeah. and stuff, American actors are talking about it too. They're saying yeah. the younger generation now. If you're an actor, they look at your social media following and they look at all the stuff. So it's, like it's, 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 it's happening everywhere. Yeah. But the difference, and, I feel, and people often call us out for this, they're like, oh, why are you so harsh on a Malaysian movie, but you're not as harsh on, an, on a similar American movie of the same genre? And I'm like, yes, America makes this many movies and they have the space and the money to do it. We don't. Yeah. We make about 40 movies and we're funding the wrong 40. Mm. And I think that's the problem. It's scale. Yeah. 
So if we keep making this bad stuff, then people think that's all there is. And trust me, it is something that has happened for decades and it's very hard to unlearn. So much so that now, you don't have to go far. When I tell people, watch that cover girl, what's the first question I get? Sure or not? Mm. Are you just bluffing? Are you mm. sure? Yeah. It's a Malaysian? Are you saying it's good? For it's a Malaysian? Good? Or are you saying it's good for a Malaysian show? Yeah. Same with La Luna. Yeah. No one believes this because they've had their heart broken so many times. Now they like they ask you the same question over and over again. Sure or not? Yeah. That's to your friend, is it? Yeah. Like, like literally, that's what they yeah. keep asking. And I cannot blame them because, and you know this very well, uh, in public, all of the actors and the industry will say nice things. But when you have conversations with them in private, that's the dirty secret. They'll all be like, oh, Omar, don't waste your time. Right? It's bad. And so the public has become very untrusting. Uh, and I think that's where we come in as critics. Lah. Like, I think that's the thing. So we're just like, no, no, no. Trust us. Okay, we didn't like it for this reasons, but you may, it may not be for us, mm. but you may like it, right? And so that factor plays like a really, like that's a really important thing. But I, I cannot like, so I go back to, I mean, not just because you're here and we're talking to you, lah, but I think there are some things you did in that cover girl, which displayed that stuff that we're always looking for, mm. that attention to detail that we spoke about even in our review, right? Uh, even in the final scenes of the first episode, uh, which was somewhat of a tribute to Wonka Wai and all of that stuff. I mean, it's there and you notice it. And if you look at La Luna and go and watch that movie if you haven't yet, but there's an attention to detail. And when I'm watching the movie 20 minutes in, you already are like, oh, this director spent time thinking about this. Mm. And like, that's what and you love like. that part. You know, you know, somebody has thought about it. Somebody yeah. is, has really put attention to Because he's not insulting you as well. He's not talking down to you as yeah. the audience, yeah. right? You're not spoon feeding you. He's not spoon yeah. feeding yeah. you. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, oh, because, and that was a great thing about watching both Dead Cover Girl, La Luna, uh, Imagine Noor was another one, which we really like, uh, Tiga Janda, mm. uh, which was last year. Was it this year? That was Tiga last Janda year. Was last, year. Yeah, last year. Hungry Ghost Diner was this year. Hungry Ghost Diner. Yeah. All of that had those elements where you're like, you think you know where it's going to go because you've seen 100 Malaysian movies. And then when the person doesn't say that obvious line or provide that obvious exposition, you're like, oh, that's nice. Mm. Yeah, he's not hating me over the head with yeah. it, you know? Yeah, you're not dumbing me down. You're yeah. basically yeah. not yeah. telling yeah. me what to like and what not to like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great. So it's something we don't see very often, which is unfortunate. But I'm not saying there isn't. Huh? I'm yeah. saying there are people out there who are probably writing these things, we're just not seeing them. Mm. There's two things. There's one is that, and then the other thing is, of course, I am convinced due to parents, Malaysian parents and our education system, I am convinced that we've lost at least two or three generations of good writers mm. who are now doctors and accountants and lawyers. <laughs> You're right. Which is not a bad thing. I hope they're good doctors and lawyers and accountants, but I think it was beaten out of them as kids. Maybe they're just writing script, you know, during the free time, free time. in the, in, yeah. in the, yeah. the yeah. doctor's yeah. Yeah. breakout, breakout because, room. Okay, yeah. And you know, their parents weren't wrong. Parents would have said, listen, if you want money, go and do this. Because <laughs> we know enough people who are in the creative industry yeah. who don't make enough I money. I mean, that's the first question we always ask some kid. Yeah. We recently had a meeting with someone a couple of years ago, right? He was a lawyer and he wanted to go into the creative industry, right? And literally the first thing we asked him was, you don't like money, is it? <laughs> because it's just like, I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, so you really need to have a certain wherewithal lah. So taking from there, uh, I think um, when you're looking back on, on the stuff, what or all you have done and some and, and what have been some of your favorite reviews uh, or discussions on Burglar uh, and why did they stand out for you so much? We really enjoy reviewing bad things. Huh? I mean, they're the most funnest. I mean, you cannot run away from the fact. Every time yeah. you're interview reviewing something that's truly terrible, uh, even as a writer, it really lets you flex lah. Like, so just yeah. on a personal level, uh, as someone who's practicing their craft, when you're writing a bad yeah. review, it is the most fun. Uh, I, think, I think flex is the word. It's yes. Because you get to, because again, we don't, we don't want a review of a bad movie to be three words. This is bad. Yeah. Yeah, three words. We, <laughs> that's not what we want, right? We don't want an empty page that just says this is bad. You want to tell you why it's bad. You want to break it down. You want to, and then with that, you make jokes, you make inside bits, mm. but then you do your research. What else has the filmmaker done? So I think I did, ah, oh man, I can't remember the title now, but there was a series on Netflix that was released and it was horrible. And then you, and then I did the research on the director and I'm like, oh, he's also done 
but he's done these three great things. So then the joke is like, did he just package it in? Is it like a package deal where he sold yeah, these three like, really good ones and then sell two third one free? This is yeah. my this is my <laughs> passion throw, idea. It's not very good. Throws in a really bad one. So you do that, right? You get to play with that way. Um, I did one on the bubble by uh, Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow, which was that was bad. Right? That was oh. bad. And again, you get to play, like Umar was saying, you get to flex with your descriptions. That was, you that get was basically Netflix throwing him money during the exactly. pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, give yeah, me get something. all your friends together yeah, and just give make me something. something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you get to flex. You get How to. How I write. wish we can we can get the, that kind of friends. Yeah. Right, yeah. just yeah. someone giving you money to do yeah, stuff like, for do free, stuff. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think. For me as well, I think there, there's two, right? You, you really like writing the bad reviews. Those are super fun. And we like doing those on the podcast as well, right? Um, but I think it's very interesting how directors react to that. And I think there are some directors who are aware. Actually, I think most Hollywood directors are aware. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, that, yeah, some, sometimes you have a winner. Sometimes you just don't, right? If it's, you the want, name, it's the name of the game. And I think it's the name of the game. And it rolls off their backs. And yeah. you know, with, with local directors, I think uh, the best example I can think of is Adrian. Uh, Adrian's made some good movies, some movies we didn't like so much, right? But he understands where we're coming from. Also because even in our bad reviews, yes, we can be sarcastic and a little cutting, but it's never personal. We're never mm. attacking the person. And I think that's the most important thing that critics and reviewers need to take away. And so, what was it called? Pasal Kao. Yeah, mm. we hated that movie. Uh, Adrian Thay's attempt at a rom-com, right? But we liked Pascal, we liked Weera, uh, we thought The Assistant was pretty decent. Mm. And, and, you know, I admire his ambition. And so even as I'm watching his films, I'm like, oh, actually, I can see what he's trying to achieve and I can see where it falls short. Mm. And I think that's the best way to approach any kind of review, right? The best way to approach any kind of review. Judge a movie based on whether it achieves what it's set out to do. And so even our score ratings, whether it's 4 out of 10, 5 out of 10, 10 out of 10, is did the director, the writer, achieve what they set out to do? Mm -hmm. So I, you can't say, oh, I prefer Star Wars, which is a 9 out of 10, versus you know Star Trek 2, which I only gave an 8 out of 10. You can't compare them. They're completely different beasts. So that rating that you give and that review that you give is based on what that movie set out to do and how well it achieved it. The other thing that I... You know what are the hardest reviews? The hardest reviews are when you really love something. Yeah. It's the hardest. You review. cannot uh, take what? yourself away from, from, from that. I'm telling you, man. Like uh, I, I didn't know where to start my review of Dune. I was just mm. like... Like, you know, because I loved the books for so long and then there was the David Lynch stuff and all the sci-fi channel stuff. And then what Denny Villeneuve did, I was just like, I don't know how he made this happen. But it actually like brought what mm. I had in my head onto the screen mm. and I didn't know where to start. The hardest reviews are the ones of the movies you love. Mm. You're right. You're completely right in yeah. that one. What are some of the challenges you face in offering uh, criticism and commentary in the fast-paced world of entertainment. People hate you. <laughs> Directors hate you. <laughs> I think. I think for us, it's that fast-paced nature of the current world that we live yeah. in. Yeah. We've seen maybe 150 films, and I think more than that by now. I've I'm, lost track. I, I've oh, lost track. And the TV shows. And then not even considering the TV shows, could be about 180 years old. And not all of them get reviewed because some of them are just middling, some of them are just bad, some of them are fine. Also, right? there's just no time. Also, there's just no time, <laughs> right? And I think that is for us the biggest challenge because we want to be we want to be holistic. We want to cover as much as we can, but at the same time, we also don't want to cover a thing that Uma and I wouldn't normally watch. Mm. You know, yes, we try and reach out to everything, but when somebody reaches out and says, oh, I've got this film from China coming up. And I'm like, we've got a lot on our plate right now. And that's not a movie we would normally reach out to or do. So we'll have to drop that. Yeah. So the, we the constantly is, have to make that decision. Yeah. yeah, the picking and choosing is hard. Uh, because obviously there's some stuff that we miss as well because there is so much stuff. like. Mm. Yeah, every like, Friday, you have like three things to... Or three, three or four. Three. I mean, yeah, like, I think Netflix that. releases like 40 things a week and yeah. you're just like, what is good, what is out there? And if, even then, even when Netflix releases a bunch of stuff like that, we don't even know what's coming out. We get a list from the PR team and they go like, oh yeah, these are the 12 movies. And then we go on our own Netflix pages because the algorithm is pretty decent. I get recommended something. I'm like, 
oh, why didn't you tell me about this thing? Yeah. You know? Because, you know, it's not going to be the stuff. Like, there'll be another 10 things from Brazil. Yeah. And another three things from India. And yeah. you're like, yeah. it's like, wait, all of this looks pretty good. Like, yeah. where do we start? Yeah. So, the that's one of the hardest things. The picking and choosing what to review and what to talk about. However, that said, I think the fast pace of release is one thing. But we don't have to be... I think with film, we still have to be incredibly timely. But with the streaming stuff, we don't. Because if we're having trouble, God knows everyone else is having trouble. So there's a lot of times that people aren't... People aren't watching everything all the time. So yeah. they're waiting as well. Mm-hmm. So actually, you don't have to review every Netflix movie mm-hmm. and TV show as it drops because God knows people don't have the time to get to exactly. it. Like during the pandemic, <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> you had nothing else to do. You're just sitting at home yeah. and you're watching everything, right? But now, people are back to normal life. And so I think with the streaming stuff, you don't have to be as timely. I think with film, you still do because there is still a critical mass of people who are all watching and talking about the same thing at the same time. Or who, yeah. are want, who want to know about the thing ah, at the same time. Who want to know about yeah. the thing at the same time, right? The uh, other sort of, sorry, the other funny thing about streaming is that unless it's very good, the internet noise dies within two days. Yeah. Well, with Binge. No, obviously with Binge, yeah, with, with, binge. with Netflix Binge, right? With the so, weekly releases, yeah. the noise, I mean, we've looked at the data, it's and yes. It's fairly consistent, mm. yes. yeah. Okay. And then, or it goes up because more people hear about it, then they start watching again from episode one and whatever, right? But with the Binge stuff, when Netflix does a Binge drop, maybe the Friday, Saturday, but by Sunday, anybody who's cared about it has seen it, has talked about yeah. it on Twitter, but then they've all moved on. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we joke about people hating us, but no, actually the reality is what makes our job quite easy as film critics is both Bahia and I are outside. We don't have any skin in the game. Yeah. We have no ambitions to make a film or whatever, right? So we were on the, I think being on the outside helps. And I think that also means that the people in the industry as well who know us or who have heard of us also know that there isn't any kind of agenda there. Mm. Yeah. Which I think is often prevalent in a lot of Malaysian conversations. I think it's also because we're older. In Possibly. That, in that everybody knows this isn't a stepping stone to something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is kind of it. What we like. <laughs> this yeah. is, well, this is what you guys love and yes, that's why yes. I think yeah. it shows in the work yeah. you're in the, yeah. and the kind of stuff you're But I think that's the difference, right? Like a younger critic may be like, oh, I may want to go into TV later. Oh, I may want to go and do that. So they're always trying to do big things so they get the attention. But then mm. they temper everything else, But then they else, temper right? their critique or they, they be a little too careful or they go too far. For us, we just don't care, really. But I, I still think the local industry has a ways to go with regards to understanding that. Like, you know, we have absolutely no problems with uh, any of the foreign criticism we do. Like, mm. we never get penalized for it. We shit on a lot of Netflix stuff. We shit on a lot of American movies. And, and, and even the distributors in Netflix, they know when they've got a good product. They know when they've got a bad product. They completely understand They've done it. their market research. They've done their, their market mm. research. They completely understand it. You know, they'll know this one's a winner, this one's not. Or, you know, Uma, I think you're really going to like this one. Uma, I know you're going to hate this one. You know, that happens a lot, right? Uh, the local industry, though, we have heard stories. Oh, yeah, this fellow's blacklisted. Like, yeah. I'm going to sue this fellow for saying bad things about my yeah. movies. I'm just like, there's no gain in that at all. And it just feels like a very... Uh, thankless, publish- thankless job you're doing. Uh, no, no, but it also seems like a very entitled conversation. Like, yeah. oh, I have made this thing, you must love it. Yeah. <laughs> right? How dare you not love this thing that I've made, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, it's, like, um, it's like the car industry. I think the car industry is a very interesting thing in that reviewers of cars and reviews of cars, yet again, these are old players in the market. The Disney, the Warners, the Toyotas, the Hondas, they're old players in the market. I think they've been in the industry for so long that they understand what criticism means. How do you approach it? How do you deal with it? I think our industry is still relatively young in that sense, or at least the approach to PR is relatively young. And so they approach it sometimes in a very antagonistic way, Mm -hmm. which I don't think helps them. So what advice would you give to these aspiring critiques who, who want to give their criticism to the content they watch and they want to tread means get into wow. that that space because I think every day nowadays whoever has a social media account and a mobile phone oh. is a critic yeah. yes so but if somebody wants to get seriously into the whole you know uh, reviewer criticism yeah. 
uh, of content uh, what are the advice i, I mean now if you have a phone you're critical of everything yeah. no but i not think not just movies yeah. books uh, my nasi lemma my car parking space <laughs> everything is terrible right but i think i think it's the it's the taking it seriously <clears throat> yeah right we said earlier oh we've seen you know almost 200 films this year we saw 200 tv shows you know I get no love from my parents like yeah sure but hey you sat at home and watched 200 movies wow woe is me right you're not but I think the point is that it's a job I think <clears throat> you have to treat it like a job you have to we get up at 7 and I'm at my computer by 7:30 if I'm editing I'm answering emails I'm we've got schedules oh what what are we doing for a podcast later oh I need to watch that thing oh we've got to do this thing we got to do that thing it's a job it may be air quotes fun but it's a job and then and that includes the research yeah includes the reading of the variety articles and the paramount artic- and the uh, paramount plus well, no the variety plus thing <clears throat> reading the hollywood reporter knowing your way around imdb's uh, top list and financial list and knowing how the rotten tomato art- rotten tomato system works it's a job it's not just oh i watched the movie i liked it five stars Yeah. What does that mean, right? What does that mean for the world? What does that mean for the industry? What does that mean for the guy on the street? It encompasses everything. And I think if you want to get into it, treat it like a job. Treat it like how you would treat any other job. You prepare, you do homework, you do research, maybe even take classes and courses. Uh, I totally agree with all of that. It's you have to the first step is you got to watch that. I know or I've spoken to a lot of people who call themselves critics and writers and stuff like that and they don't watch stuff or mm. they don't watch enough stuff mm. and I think you've got to watch stuff whether or not you write a review about yeah. it it doesn't matter just mm. watch stuff because all of that adds to your bank mm. and eventually you will start making those connections that are important when you want to actually talk to when you actually want to talk about something uh, I will add something else which is I think you have to read a lot I don't mm. think if you want to be a film critic it isn't just about watching films and TV shows I think you have to read. I think literature informs film and the other way around. Comic books inform film and the other way around. They're all three completely different mediums. Um and that's why I don't think adaptations are easy. I think they're very complex, but only if you read do you have a better understanding of how characters are developed, how arcs are developed and all of that stuff. I think it comes it goes in hand in, it goes yeah. hand in hand la and it's not just reading uh, it's listening to music it's it's consuming that kind of pop content because all of it informs each other and the very simple most basic example or i guess poppy example is you look at something like James Gunn and how he makes his films mm. right they're very <laughs> literary they're root they're, they're steeped in pop music and they're very very accomplished pieces of filmmaking because mm. the visual art and the visual style is still there so like he's a great example of a director that uses all of those things so i think if you want to be a critic you have to respect the person who's making the work as well and so don't just watch the one movie and then just dab around about it because then nobody cares right so you have to do that consumption yourself you have yeah. to be studied about it yeah yeah and i don't mean in an academic sense but yeah. however that's it <clears throat> I think you need to learn those things too so it's in like you don't have to talk about Dutch angles in a movie like mm. that's fine there's another there's another way of phrasing it so it's accessible to everyone but you need to know what that means yes because if you don't need, yeah. if you don't know what that means then yeah. what's the point it's the <clears throat> but it's uh, and to talk to just double down on what Uma's talking about reading we're not just saying oh read Robert McKay story. We're not just saying oh, yeah, go no. read Save the Cat. We're not just saying read, read those like books on movie criticism. Yeah. No, 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 that's no, not no. the point. The, what we're saying is you have to read books. Yeah. Because just from from a different perspective. It's not even that. For me like I'm not a writer as Uma is a writer. I just put words down on the page. But the reason I am able to put words down is because I read. It's not it's not writing a karangan it's not writing a, a homework because yes. you have to consume you have to analyze you have to interpret you then have to then release it yeah. and that comes from knowing words knowing choices of words knowing sentence structures yeah that's the first question people always ask 
oh, how do you become a writer? And I'm just like, well, you got, it's not something you can teach. You become a writer based on how much you read because mm. then there's an automatic absorption of knowing what is right and what works. Mm. No one taught me how to do it, but because I read a lot, there is an understanding. Like you can, you sure you can teach someone, mm. but then it just becomes functional sentences yeah, yeah, yeah. on and, a page. <clears throat> sorry, just to, and it's funny because you you were talking earlier about the hardest writing and the, uh, the hardest articles to write, the easiest articles to write. When I have my first sentence, everything flows. When I don't have that first sentence, I go I go read Tolkien, I go read a comic book, because. Something I don't get triggered. It is not in that in part, because I don't read as regularly as you do. But when I need to write, I need to read. I need to see the words. Then the words sort of start to form up. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then suddenly I have thoughts. Yeah. And then I can put thoughts to page. And also just the other, th- like reading Tolkien, reading a comic book. Mm. Uh, in the background here, you've got, you've got Shakespeare and stuff like that. I think you should read Shakespeare. Whether you understand it or not, it's a different story. Shakespeare is one of those funny things. The more you read it, the more you understand it. You don't know mm. how you understand it. Like half the English feels alien because it's so old, but yet it somehow gets in your brain. Mm. But the reason I think you should read something like Shakespeare is because everything comes from Shakespeare. Whether mm. you want it, whether you believe it or not, every Tamil movie you've seen, every Hindi movie you've seen, all of the ideas existed in Shakespeare. Yeah. He invented so much of the English language, all of the plot points you see in the MCU yeah. are Shakespearean. Shakespearean. Yeah. That's why it was so easy for Kenneth Branagh to make Thor, because he was just like, well, it's all there. Yeah. It's a Shakespearean play, right? And so when you read all of that stuff, you get a better understanding of where these things come from. And I think that's mm. really important. And just to give you a bit of a trivia, Creatus 2 is also from, from, from the Shakespearean, uh, you know, inspired by Shakespeare. This is Macbeth. Yeah, very nice. Oh, very nice. Where the witches are standing near the yeah, stupa. Yeah. So that was because this was all drilled down in, in my education when, yeah, I was when you were going to school, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's the most important piece yeah. of advice we would give to anyone. Put in the work, do the research, yeah. read, watch. Yeah. It's stuff. Because I've seen people, I've read people's writings who have written from the point of view of, oh, I've studied these writing books. I've studied McKay. I've studied huh. all these things. And then the writing's terrible. It's because you know character, you know the story must have three arcs. You know what the call of act, call ah. to adventure is. Yes. You know all these things. You know A blot, B blot, C But blot. you don't know how to get characters to talk to each other. You're right? Yeah. They don't sound like humans. You have to trigger and how it, yes. it works yeah, uh, yes. as a flow. Yes. You can't just tell me, oh, <clears throat> uh, on page seven is the inciting incident. Or not page seven, but the inciting incident happens here. But is the inciting incident good? Is there a reason for the inciting incident? What is the inciting incident of your inciting incident? Yeah. Because you can't just like get there. There has to be a reason to get there. Yeah. Your character has the reason to have to get up in the morning. And that's what they forget sometimes because they've read the formulas, but they haven't read the creative. Last question. What are the best three content pieces you have seen this year? Film, okay. TV show? I think. Or even, even audio. Oh, okay. Mm, I mean, La Luna is high up there. La Luna is very high up there. Yeah. Um, as three is very hard for us to narrow down, my friend, because we've seen so many things. Let's go to that's... five then. Okay, you go to five. You go to five. Okay, so I think La Luna is absolutely fantastic as from a Malaysian point of view with regards to Malay content. For me, The Last of Us was a phenomenal mm. piece of work uh, because I think people can actually study that on how to how to properly adapt something. I think adaptation is one of the hardest tasks. Whether you're adapting it to a TV show or a movie is irrelevant. It's just so difficult, right? And I think The Last of Us is a great example of how you adapt something. I think that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, There's a movie that's not out and you haven't seen it yet, but it will come out. It's a Japanese submission for the Oscars. It's called Perfect Days. Perfect Days. Uh, It's by Vim Vendors. And he set it in Tokyo, full cast of Japanese actors. Of course, Vim is German, I believe. Yeah. And I mean, I love that for a couple of reasons. One, I love that the Japanese are so confident in their own culture and art that they pick a German director's film to be their Oscar submission. I think that's fantastic. But separately, the movie is, it's, it's for me, it's one of those, like I have a real problem with art house indie movies that mm. uh, aspire to be art house indie movies. You know, like if you have a bingo card, you can just tick it off and you'll win bingo in five minutes because it's just like really inaccessible. This for me is an art house film that is accessible, that is beautiful, that has character arcs and stories and tells a story about a man who's a toilet cleaner. And literally it goes through the days of his life. 
And it's so amazing. There are beautiful moments of repetition. Mm. Like you're watching and you're just like, wait, we're seeing the same, we're almost seeing the same thing repeat his daily routine for like the first 20 minutes of the film. And yet it's completely engrossing. And there's so little dialogue, but it gives you this deep understanding of what it m means to be Japanese. Lah. And, and yeah, and it's so beautifully done. It's like, so Perfect Days is right up there for me. Um, yeah, Kilos of Flower Moon was good. Lah. Like that for me was... I went into that apprehensive about a three hour, 26 minute movie. Um, also because I didn't necessarily like the Irishman as much. Mm. Um, I found the Irishman to be a bit self-indulgent. Mm. But that, this was... That was Netflix money, that's why. That was Netflix money. Uh, and you know, Scorsese going, hey, old friends, <laughs> come along, we got some Netflix money. Um, and so, yeah, Killers was good. Man, I loved Guardians Volume 3. Mm. Um, I love me a good James Gunn movie. I think for me, the James Gunn films kind of trigger all of the things that I loved growing up. The Back to the Futures, the Star Wars, is like those are the things that inspired me growing up. I like the way he kind of brings that all together and uses it to tell his own stories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Guardians Volume 2 was, was worth a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, wait. I watched Oppenheimer eight times, so I think that is definitely up there. Yeah. yeah, 24 hours of my life, 32 hours, no, 32 to 8 times, no, yeah, uh, almost, yeah, just a lot, a lot of my life. Was and you saw it in an all glory also yes, in, I did. in Australia. Yes, I did. The wife thinks I'm nuts. She's like, you know how much of your life you've wasted watching Oppenheimer? I think like, you're nuts. I don't think it's a waste. <laughs> yeah. I think you're nuts, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, or is it, you know, I, <clears throat> I think the problem is that I don't have as good a memory as yours, but like, I think absolutely... Uh, La Luna. The other one is The Makanai. Oh, it's a yeah. series on Netflix. Japanese Jai. series on Netflix. Oh, yeah. Koreda. Just beautiful. Um, I. Uh, what else did I see this year? Gosh. It's too many, man. It's too many. I have a habit of just forgetting them once I've. I've we have. Them. We have. A, we have an Apple. Note. Can I? Can I? Can I pull up my phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. We actually yeah. list everything we have now. List now. We have, like, we have, we've had to start making this list because there's no other way to keep it up. I just cannot. So you have it. your letterbox, uh, you know. We no, don't. No. We don't. Letterbox people, is just more trouble. So people have been bothering Goggler to start a letterbox account, but we are just like, we barely have enough time to manage all of these other social media mm. things. You want us to do a letterbox account yeah. as well? It's like, oh, Argentina 1985 was fan. Fantastic. Oh my God, that's uh, a great film. Yeah, uh, that was great. Technically, <laughs> that's last year, but we only got to see we it We only this got year. to watch it this year. I also really like A Man Called Otto. Oh yeah, that was good. Tom Hanks uh, one. Yeah. Tom Hanks one. Uh, the Mark and I was fantastic. Uh, so I'm just scrolling through. I'm just picking up names as I as I see them. Um, yeah. Deadlock. Amazon Prime. Oh Deadlock, my god. Fan effing tastic. Okay. Have you not seen this? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. go <clears throat> home tonight. Yeah. It's set in the fictional town of Deadlock in Australia, which is this small town. And it's centered around a murder. It's inspired by Scandi Noah, but... In an Australian way. It's an, in an Australian comedic way. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. yes. But just because it's a comedy, it doesn't mean they don't take the mystery seriously. Yeah. So the murder mystery plays out like a yeah, real, like murder, a real mystery, murder mystery. But the conversations are absolutely hilarious. And it has, my friend, some of the best cursing you will ever <laughs> see yeah. on television. Yeah. It's beautiful. Deadlock. Uh, D-E-A-D-L-O-C-H. Oh, yeah. Right. Deadlock. Lock. Lock. Like, yeah. Yeah. Lockless monster. Yes. yes. Like that lock, yeah. Like if you like Ianucci and if yeah. you thought oh. his cursing was good, I think this is better. Better than Ianucci, yeah. Awesome. Australians use the F word and the C word in ways you are just like, ah, it's beautiful. It's but, like... Yeah, it's, it's music. Uh, yeah. It's yeah, 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 music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The insults are music, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So this this brings us to the end of the conversation. Thank you so much, guys. It was guys. a lot of fun, man. It right. was really good talking to you, and you know that uh, I'm always been a fan of your of your work. Thank you so much. We really you. look forward to all your reviews, and uh, we 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 hope that this this whole con this review business continues, and and you come on giving us great pieces where we can learn so much, yeah. and you know. Uh, and and we can you know know more about whatever is there to watch and yeah. and, and uh, whenever that comes out. Yeah. So um, thanks a lot for for joining. Thank you for having us. Absolute pleasure, man. Yeah. Anytime. Mm -hmm.